And that's, that's my, my hope and dream, uh, and we'll, we'll try to make that happen. I, I think I'm on good pace for it. Uh, before we do that, let's go to God in prayer. God in heaven, we praise you. We thank you for revelation. We, pray, we praise you and thank you for the hope that we have uh, that if we'll be faithful and uh, live as the Lamb did, even to the point of laying down our life like he did, that we will be victorious and reign with you forever in heaven, that Satan and any beast that he employs to do his will ultimately has no power over us. Um, they can harm our bodies, but they can never harm our souls. And we're so uh, amazed by your grace and mercy that makes this possible. Help build up our faith in you and our perseverance uh, as we study Revelation tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, so last time we started the second section of Revelation in chapter 12, where the, the curtain is really pulled back for John's audience so that they see what's really going on <clears throat> behind the scenes. The reason they're suffering is not so much because Rome is bad, it's because Satan is mad. Okay, there's a much deeper thing going on. Satan tried to kill Jesus. That didn't work. He tried to stop the early church. That didn't work. And so now he's pulling out the big guns. He's using uh, Rome, kind of the military might of Rome as that first beast, and then the uh, emperor cult as the second beast, the false religion, trying to get people to worship the emperor. And, you know, that's kind of scary and depressing, this dragon and the two beasts. And, in fact, it even says that the beast has authority from God to overcome the saints and to kill them. So after you read <laughs> chapters 12 and 13, you might be a little bit uh, depressed. But then in chapter 14, he continues pulling the curtain back. Uh, but this time, he's going to show... Um, how it's all going to be uh, about Christians winning in the end. That yes, the, the beast can temporarily kill us. And so on the earth, it seems like the beast is winning. It seems like the dragon is winning. But ultimately, we're going to be reigning with Christ. And then God is going to bring down spiritual judgment on the beast for his sin. And, and the beast and his followers are going to suffer eternally. So let's get into the first vision that he sees. And I mean, I tried to look for artwork. I could not find any good artwork at all until a couple pictures of the bulls in chapter 16. And that's about it. So that's what I'm saying. There's just a, a real lack of, of good photos about Revelation. One through five, though, the lamb delivers his people. It says, then I looked and behold, the lamb was standing on Mount Zion. And with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his father written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the sound of uh, waters and the sound of a loud thunder. And the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. These are the ones who have not been defiled with women, for they have kept themselves chaste. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These have been purchased from among men as firstfruits to God and to the Lamb. And no lie was found in their mouth. They are blameless. So he references the same 144,000 who back in chapter 7 were sealed by God for His protection. And like the seal imagery, here they have God's name and the name of the Lamb on their foreheads. It's a mark of ownership, and it's a mark, of course, of their devotion to the Lamb and to the Father. And if you recall, in chapter 7 I suggested that the 144,000 was a picture of God's spiritual army on the earth. They're called by God to go to holy war against the enemy. Well, here... The curtain is pulled back, and we see that that army is not alone. We didn't actually see this picture. Earlier, we just saw them on the earth in chapter 7. But here, the curtain's pulled back, and we see that actually they're not alone uh, in their fight. The lamb is with them. He's standing with them. He's fighting for them. It's kind of like when Elisha opened the eyes of his servant, you know, and he saw the, the chariots of fire, you know, surrounding them on the mountain. Because God was with them. Well, here we see a mountain with Jesus, the Lamb, standing on it, fighting for his people. Mount Zion was the hill upon which Jerusalem was built. And in the prophets, it became symbolic um, for the ultimate city of God, where he and his people dwell, you know, victoriously in safety, and they've defeated all, all their enemies. They're, they're ruling from Zion. Uh, just a few verses 
about this in Scripture. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, His holy mountain. Beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king. God in her palaces has made himself known as a stronghold. And then Psalm 2, God says, As for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. Do homage to the sun that he not become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. But how blessed are all who take refuge in him. So it's a picture of God's son in Psalm 2 reigning victoriously over and crushing his enemies while his people take refuge in him. Um, And that's really what's going on in Revelation. And you know, the church sometimes is referred to as Mount Zion, but heaven is really the ultimate Zion, the ultimate city of God where we'll dwell with him in peace. And that's where this new song comes from in verses 2 and 3. This new song in Scripture, um, this is repeated several times throughout the Old Testament about a new song. It's the idea that you're rejoicing because God has created a new situation for you. It's it's, It's a totally new situation because your enemies are no longer a problem. And this song is loud it says, you know, it's the sound of many waters because you have all these, you know, 144,000 singing it. But it's also beautiful. It's compared to the sound of the sound of harpists. Uh, later, we'll talk about them holding harps. Uh, but here it's just their voice is like the sound of harpists. It's just this beautiful sound of, of deliverance. Uh, verse 4 is interesting. The law of Moses taught that whenever you went to war, to holy war for God, you were to remain ceremonially clean by abstaining from any sexual activity, uh, even if you were married. Uh, this is why when David tries to get Uriah, you remember, to go and lie with Bathsheba to cover up the pregnancy, that Uriah refused. Because he says, my men are out in battle. I'm not going to be, you know, sexual with my wife while my men are out there. And, of course, there's just some level of integrity there that maybe is disconnected from God's law. It's just an, I'm over here having fun and pleasure while my men are dying and risking their lives. There's that level of integrity. But I think it goes deeper in, in that he's trying to stay. It's this undivided attention, this full focus on battle, not on, not on uh, pleasure even the pleasure of marriage. Uh, The image could also connote spiritual purity, since later in Revelation, the church will be pictured as this bride that's presented as a a pure virgin, really, uh, to to our husband. There's also language about that in Scripture. Uh, It's the idea that we've not defiled ourselves with idolatry, but we've kept ourselves solely devoted to the Lamb. Uh, In fact, it says that uh, we follow, the the 144,000 follow the Lamb wherever He goes. And this, to me, is a somewhat disturbing twist to the scene. Because what it implies is that they have died. The 144,000 are dead. Remember, God gave the beast authority to kill the saints in His spiritual army. And they have followed the Lamb really to the point of the cross. It's why they're called the first fruits. Uh, because whenever the first of your crops came in, you would offer those crops as a sacrifice to God. And the first fruits was always a, a sign or a signal of more crops to come. And just like the lamb in Isaiah 53:10, it says there was no deceit found in his mouth. So too... They are innocent, like Jesus the Lamb. And just like lambs had to be um, blameless and have no defect whatsoever in order to be pleasing to God as a sacrifice, so too are these Christians pleasing lambs to God um, as they've sacrificed themselves for Him. And so really the point is the path to true victory over the dragon and the beast is not for God's spiritual army to face, to pick up swords, you know, and go to battle with them in some violent earthly conflict. It's to stay faithful in their devotion to God and in their witness of the testimony of the lamb, even if they die for it. And that's really how the lamb fights for them. He he cleanses them of their sins, which makes them blameless and makes them this acceptable sacrifice to God. But then he also gives them the courage 
to lay down their lives for God's will like he did. And really, that shows that the dragon and the beast, they have no ultimate power over, over them. They can kill their bodies, can't kill their souls. So they have the ultimate victory. Any comments or thoughts on one through five? Questions? Okay. Well, judgment is coming for the beast's followers. Uh, we'll just uh, we'll kind of break this into sections. I'm doing that on purpose. You'll see why um, a little bit later. Verses six and seven says, I saw another angel flying in mid heaven, having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth and to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And he said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of waters. So we're still seeing behind the scenes in the heavenly realm. And so I, probably what's going on here is as the 144,000 in the spiritual army are on the earth doing battle, they're preaching the gospel. They're sharing the good news with the world. And so he's pulling the curtain back on their kind of angelic counterpart. I remember in, uh, earlier in Revelation, the churches are all represented by angels. Uh, and so here, it, it's like what's happening on earth is the spread of the gospel, and it's seen from a heavenly perspective, almost like an angel is the one doing it here. <clears throat> and then in verse 8... I saw another angel, a second one followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who has made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality. Uh, Babylon, basically a code name for Rome. Um, it makes sense because Rome, you know, is just as arrogant as Babylon. Babylon destroyed the temple of God's people in the Old Testament. Well, now Rome... Not only did Rome destroy the actual physical temple in AD 70, uh, but now they're destroying, they're trying to destroy the spiritual temple. They're trying to destroy the church. <clears throat> well, the, the spread of the gospel is good news uh, for the righteous, those that are willing to repent, but it's really bad news for Rome, so much so that he, this angel speaks as if Rome is already gone, as if Babylon has already fallen. And this language actually comes from literal Babylon in Isaiah 21.9, uh, and one said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon, and all the images of her gods are shattered on the ground. And, you know, like Babylon before it, Rome, in verse 8, you know, it's, it's been a sinful influence on the other nations of the world. They've drunk from her, from her wine of immorality and, and really become intoxicated by the sin of Rome. It's the imagery drawn here. Well, next section, um, verses 9 through 12, another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night. Those who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name, here is the person perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. So basically all of those who have been intoxicated by Rome's wine are going to be intoxicated by the wine of God's wrath. He's making that kind of play on words. And of course, this comes from the Old Testament too. Psalm 75 says this, a cup is in the hand of the Lord, and the wine foams. It is well mixed, and he pours out of this. Surely all the wicked of the earth must drain and drink down its dregs. It gets worse. They suffer an eternal fate of fire and brimstone, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever, and they find no rest. Uh, here's a passage from the Old Testament about God's vengeance against all the nations who have oppressed his people. He says this in Isaiah 34, the Lord has a day of vengeance, a year of recompense, look at that, for the cause of Zion. <laughs> this is for my people. 
Its streams will be turned into pitch, and its loose earth into brimstone, and its land will become burning pitch. It will not be quenched night or day. Its smoke will go up forever. From generation to generation, it will be desolate. None will pass through it forever and ever. This is why in verse 12, he tells the saints to persevere <laughs> instead of giving in to the beast. Because if you become one of those with the mark of the beast on you, then you're going to suffer this horrible eternal fate. But in contrast, if you stay faithful to the Lord, that brings us to verse 13. I heard a voice from heaven saying, right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds will follow them. So again, from an earthly perspective, it looks like, no, 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 those who die, like they lose, right? If the, if the beast is the one killing people, the beast is the one winning. But here he's actually saying, no, when you're willing to be killed by the beast and die for the Lord, you, you actually enter a state of blessedness, of, of supreme approval and favor from God. You, you find true rest, whereas the enemy never has any rest. So, so what that does is it shows that Christians suffer temporarily by the beast, but then the beast and his followers suffer eternally. So it may seem like it's the worst thing, but it's really not. The worst thing is coming for the beast and their followers. Now, the reason I divided that up into sections is that it, it's actually a really nice outline for the rest of Revelation. Verses 6 and 7 is actually a preview of chapters 15 and 16. And then verse 8 is a preview of 17 and 18. Verse 9 through 12 is a preview of 19 through 20. And then verse 13 is a preview of 21 and 22, and I'll explain why that is here. Uh, so in verses 6 and 7, this voice talks about how uh, everybody needs to fear God and give Him glory because the hour of His judgment has come. Well, in 15 and 16, it's all about the hour of God's judgment being poured out with those bowls of wrath, and as a result, the nations are going to fear and glory and, and worship God. Well, in verse 8, he talks about fallen is Babylon the great because she has, he describes her as a she. She's, you know, given the, uh, her wine to the nations. Well, that's going to be further developed in 17 and 18 where Babylon is described as a harlot who, again, is a she who is intoxicating the world with her immorality. Uh, so that's a preview there. Uh, and then also uh, 9 through 12, <clears throat> um, is a preview because 19 and 20 is going to talk about how the two beasts and their followers and the dragon are thrown into the fire, the, the lake of fire. <clears throat> so it's about the downfall of the beasts and their followers, and so is 19 and 20. And then verse 13 talks about blessed are those who die in the Lord. Well, 21 and 22 is all about the blessings of God's people and the, the new heavens and new earth and just being in God's presence forever. Uh, so that's just a really a helpful way to, to break down the rest of the book. It may seem like Rome and its followers are getting away with it, but they will be brought down. God's people will be victorious. Any questions through verse 13 or comments? <clears throat> yeah, David. In verse 11 there, whoever receives the mark of his name... Is that tattoos? Yeah, I don't think so. Um, I, think, uh, I think it's a figurative mark, just like when we have the seal of God upon us is a figurative seal. It's not something literal. Um, and it was basically the, the sign that you gave your allegiance to the Roman emperor and, and to Rome. Yeah. Um, interestingly, too, I had this in the bonus thoughts in my notes, so... I thought I'll just share if it comes up. And it came up. Thank you. Uh, so uh, the, the word mark is a different word from the word seal in the Greek. And the word mark is never used of God's people in Revelation. Seal is never used of wicked people. Okay, the seal and the mark are both signs of ownership. But what's interesting is the seal carries with it the connotation of protection. Mark, no protection. <laughs> if you got the mark of the beast, you are not protected from God's wrath at all. You're not protected spiritually in any way. You're, you're totally lost spiritually because you're allegiance with the beast. But if you have the seal of God on you, ah, 
Yes, now not only do you belong to God, but he's going to protect you. He's going to save you. So that's just a cool distinction, I think. All right, well, let's, uh, let's keep going. Let's talk about the grain and the grapes. Okay, so uh, verse 14 through 20. And I looked, and behold, a, a white cloud. And sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man, having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. Then he who sat on the cloud swung his swickle, uh, swickle, <laughs> that's a new word, uh, sickle over the earth, <laughs> and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, and he also had a sharp sickle. Then another angel, the one who has power over fire, came out from the altar, and he called with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Put in your sharp sickle, and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, because her grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle to the earth, and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth, and threw them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood came up from the winepress up to the horses' bridles for a distance of 200 miles. So John pulls... Uh, you know, his paint colors, probably mainly from, from Joel 3.13, where he says, put in the sickle, this is about judgment, for the harvest is ripe, come tread, for the wine press is full, the vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Now, there is a debate about this section of Revelation, surprise, surprise, uh, but it's actually a good debate. There's a debate over every section, uh, but uh, most debates are not good. This one is actually pretty good. There's good arguments on both sides, um, but I, I see this as two separate reapings. In verses 14 and 16, I see it as the reaping of the righteous, and then 17 through 20, the reaping or, or judgment on the wicked. The debate is, the other side is, that actually 14 through 16 is also the judgment on the wicked. It's just describing it in two different ways. Um, I, I, prefer, I lean toward this, this view, so that's the one I'll share. Matthew 9, Jesus said this to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. You know, when the Messiah came that, that first time, he didn't come as a reaper right, to come in, in judgment, he came as a planter. And he encouraged his disciples to be planters and to plant seeds so that his crops would grow. Um, and I believe this is what's happening in Revelation, where when the church is being a faithful witness to Jesus, right, they're, they're planting the seed of a, of a spiritual harvest. Same with the angel when he's proclaiming, you know, the, the gospel message there in, in, <clears throat> in this chapter. Um, it's not until the end that Jesus will come and reap from that, from that harvest that has been planted. <laughs> um, chapter 13 and verse 30, he says about the, the wheat and the tares, the tares being the evil ones, allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather up the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them up, but gather the wheat into my barn. Um, perhaps what is happening in verse 14 and 16 is that Jesus, this one like a son of man, he's got a golden crown, he's riding on a cloud. It's really hard not to see that as Jesus here. Um, that Jesus is gathering the wheat into his barn, protecting them, sheltering them from the from the judgment that's coming on the wicked. Uh, this, this also matches well with verse 4. We talked about how the 144,000 were really just the first fruits who would be offered to God. Well, now he's looking into the future, and there's a future harvest of, of the righteous. Just like the 144,000 were righteous, here's more righteous uh, people as well that had essentially been giving their lives in sacrifice to Jesus. But the second section is definitely one of judgment against the wicked. It's carried out, um, or at least it's commanded to be carried out by the angel with the power over fire who comes from the altar. We met this angel back in chapter 8 um, where he brought the incense to God and then God told this angel to pour out fire, you know, the fire of his wrath on the earth. And we saw that in the, in the trumpet scenes. Um, well, here the imagery changes from pouring out fire to the harvesting of grapes and then trampling them in God's wine press. Here's some language from the Old Testament. 
and this is about God's judgment against Edom. It says this in Isaiah 63, Why is your apparel red and your garments like the one who treads in the winepress? I have trodden the wine trough alone, and from the peoples there was no man with me. I also trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath, and their lifeblood is sprinkled on my garments, and I stained all my raiment. I trod down the peoples in my anger and made them drunk in my wrath, and I poured out their lifeblood. On the earth. This language really is perfect for Revelation 14 uh, because remember back in verse 8, Rome's, uh, Rome was said to make the nations drink the wine of her immorality. So now God pours out essentially the wine of his wrath and makes her drunk with it to the point where he's, he's stomping on them and the, the wine from the wine press of God's trampling is compared to blood that is just so full that it fills an area of 200 miles up to maybe six or seven feet because it's, it's up to the horse's bridle. You know, people who take these images literally have, have a really hard time with this. Uh, how in the world is there that much blood? As somebody said, there's, there's really never been that much human blood on the earth at, at any single time to cover that, that sort of um, distance. The distance more literally is 1,600 stadia. A stadia equals 600 feet. Uh, it's roughly the length of the land of Palestine. It's also a multiple of four and a multiple of ten. Uh, four is the number for the earth. Ten is the number of completion. So it's, it's complete judgment of the wicked on the wicked of the earth. I don't, I don't think this is necessarily final judgment. It's just another picture of God's judgment on Rome and the followers of the beast, which serves as a foreshadowing of the ultimate judgment to come. And I don't know about you, but I definitely would rather be the grain than the grapes in this section. This is pretty brutal stuff. And again, like, come on, give me a good picture, somebody. Like, that'd be amazing to get that captured uh, in art. But nobody, nobody tackled it. Any comments or questions through chapter 14? <clears throat> Joe? So, now, when it talks about by the modern throne, we have other hints and stuff like that. I was thinking about, is there anything that you know that this thing, 200 miles and stuff, is that in the, is that in the mouth or the concept that would be very particular to that people at that time? Or is it just so much that it would boggle their minds like the model of Galilee? Yeah, I mean, there's no, like, you can't really look in the Old Testament and see the number 1600, you know, being used. Um, the translators just make it 200 miles, you know, for us, but literally it's 1600. Stadia, you don't really see that in the Old Testament. So, yeah, other than it's the length of the land of Palestine, which would they have known that? I don't, I don't know. Uh, I, at least John knew it. So, um, that's 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 a good question. I'm not sure, Joe, that it, there's super significance to it other than that. Yeah, Herb. So, did you find this a distinction between the two reapers? The first one, it just says the first was reaped. It doesn't say what he did. With them. The sure. second one says they were thrown into the wine press. Mm -hmm. So is that giving you comfort that those are two different reapings rather than... That's one of the arguments, that, that in the second reaping, there's more action there. It's not just I'm collecting them, it's I'm collecting them, and then I'm throwing them in a wine press, and I'm trampling on them, um, whereas there's no real second action in that, in that first reaping. Yeah, that's, that's one of the arguments. Yeah. The first fruits argument is another argument um, from verse 4. These would be, you know, the, the righteous harvest that comes after that, that first fruits of the army on the earth at that time of, of God. All right, well, now we get the preparation for the seven bowls. Um, verse, we'll, we'll tackle this uh, one at a time here. Verse 1, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels who had seven plagues, which are the last, because in them the wrath of God is finished. Um, this is an introduction to the seven bowls, which are called uh, seven plagues. This comparison will make sense because in chapter 16, when the bowls are poured out, they sound a lot like the plagues of Egypt. And so did the trumpets that were poured out earlier. And there's going to be some similarities between the trumpets and the bowls. But remember, the trumpets were partial. It was like the third of the earth was affected. Here, there's no fractions, right? It's just a fullness of, of God's wrath is being pulled out, uh, poured out. And, rather, and remember, 14, 6, and 7 is a summary of these two chapters. There it says that the hour of God's judgment has come, and the call of the gospel is for everyone to fear God and give Him glory. Well... 
Before this judgment comes, there's this pause now. In verses 2 through 4, you get a scene from heaven about uh, the heavenly saints praising God for his salvation and proclaiming that all the nations will fear God and give him glory for it. So 2 through 4, I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire. Those who had been victorious over the beast in his image and the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, holding harps of God, they sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God, the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all the nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. So John again paints a scene of victory in heaven for God's people. They're going to defeat the beast completely. That sea of glass that used to be this separating boundary between God and his people back in Revelation 4, they've crossed over that sea, just like they crossed over the Red Sea earlier through, through Moses. Um, they've put these evil, chaotic waters of the sea under their feet, right? So now the sea is like glass for them, just like the sea has always been like glass, you know, for God. <clears throat> That's why... They're singing the song of Moses and the Lamb, just like Moses led the Israelites to safety. Um, so has the Lamb done for them. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out what I've got there. Okay. Harps in the Old Testament were associated with songs of joy and praise. Psalm 33, for instance, give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Sing praises to him with a harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy, for the, word of the, for the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. Notice the connection there between singing a new song and praising God for his righteous deeds. That's really a key theme in this section in 2 through 4. That's why what they do is they string together praises from all over Scripture, particularly from verses emphasizing the righteousness of God's works. So from the actual song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32... <clears throat> uh, it says this, The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are just, a God of faithfulness and without injustice. Righteous and upright is he. What John is doing in this section is he's not only showing that the Christians will defeat the beast. He's showing that when God carries out his judgment on the beast, it's not because he's some tyrannical military dictator like the beast is. He's carrying out righteous judgment so that the whole world will see his glory and repent. God's goal is really the salvation of all the nations. And when he brings judgment on Rome, he wants the whole world to see it and to come on their knees in reverence to worship him so that he can be king over their hearts. God's judgment is not just about destruction and domination, like when Rome judges nations. It's about salvation, ultimately. It's about waking people up so that they'll repent. And then this final section... 5 through 8, after these things I looked, and the temple of the tabernacle of testimony in heaven was opened. The seven angels who had the seven plagues came out of the temple, clothed in linen, clean and bright, and girded around their chests with golden sashes. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished." So interestingly, before the seven seals, we saw a vision of heaven opened where the lamb was given a scroll. Then before the seven trumpets, we saw a vision of heaven opened where this angel was presenting the incense uh, as prayers to God. Well, here, before the seven bowls, the temple of heaven is opened again. The, the implication is that all these judgments are coming from God. And these angels, they're kind of dressed like the Son of Man was dressed in, back in chapter 1, since they're kind of his representatives in bringing down judgment. And the last time we saw the four living creatures around God's throne holding golden bowls, those bowls were full of incense from the prayers of the saints. The picture uh, seems to be that the bowls full of prayers had reached its maximum capacity, right? God had heard enough of the cries of his people, of the oppression of his people. His patience is up, and now he's ready to act and return those bowls down in the form of wrath on Rome. This idea of filling the temple, uh, back in the Old Testament, it happened that when the priest came from the holy place, the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. It could be the idea that the angels were like priests entering the temple to offer the incense of the prayers of the saints. Well, now what God is doing is he's filling the temple and 
he's saying, I'm not allowing any more angels to come in here and bring prayers to me about the oppression of my people until I do something about it. Remember in chapter 6, they ask God, how long until you do something? How long until you take vengeance on, on the blood because, because of the, on our enemies because of the blood that they've shed for us? Here he says, now is the time. It could also just be, you know, God's presence filling the temple means he's with his people, right? He's, that's a good thing. When, when God's presence is in the temple, it means he's with his people. He's ready to act on their behalf. Well, we get these final, or these first five bowls. I don't know why I put one through five there. Anyway, <laughs> there's some pictures of the bowls being poured out. I thought, you know, we're pretty decent, kind of cool. <clears throat> the first bowl is boils. There's an obvious connection with the boils sent on Egypt. It's a symbol of pain and torment, whether that be, you know, physical torment or spiritual torment. Um, since, since they have the mark of the beast on them, God's going to give them a mark on their bodies, and it's not going to be, it's not going to be pleasant. The second bowl is that the, the sea is turned into blood. It's like that earlier trumpet, except back then it was a third of the sea that was affected. Now it's, it's the whole thing. So this could be talking about the, the economy of Rome. It could just be talking about the death of people uh, as well, because Rome sat upon many waters. The sea was the source of its riches from the nations, and now the whole sea is just you know filled with the blood of, of dead people. The third bowl is that all the water, not just the sea, is turned to blood. And this is still connected with the plague about turning water to blood, but it's seen here as an act of holy vengeance in answer to the prayers of the saints um, because they've, they've cried out to God. Look, in a, look actually in chapter 17 and verse 6. Chapter 17 and verse 6, he says, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. So Rome has been drinking the blood of the saints by murdering them, and God is going to give them blood to drink in return. The image is possibly that it's their own blood. Isaiah 49, he says this, I will feed your oppressors with their own flesh, and they will become drunk with their own blood, as with sweet wine. And all flesh will know that I, the Lord, am your Savior and Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. So they won't be drinking the blood of the saints anymore. They'll be drinking their own blood when they get slaughtered by their enemies. And the key here uh, in this section is that it's all righteous judgment. This sounds horrible and brutal, but he says they're worthy of it. Just like the lamb is worthy of praise and honor, the beast is worthy of judgment, and all his followers are worthy of judgment. The fourth bowl is scorching heat. This one actually doesn't really have any correspondence to the plagues in Egypt. It doesn't really have much correspondence with anything in the Old Testament uh, that I could find or that any of the commentators that I read uh, could find. But of course, God is pictured as a shade to his people. Earlier in chapter 7, actually, he says that he, he protects his people from the scorching of the sun. Well, here, there's no protection for Rome. Just The sun is just going to scorch them. Later in chapter 17, it talks about Rome being uh, burned with fire by her enemies. But those enemies actually came from within. So it you know, could be external, internal enemies. <clears throat> Yet, notice, they still, look in verse 9, uh, chapter 16, men were scorched with fierce heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who has the power of these plagues. They did not repent so as to give him glory. So they still blaspheme God, just like the beast they follow blasphemes God. They're acting like, they're acting like the beast, which is proof that God is righteous in pouring out these judgments. It's not that like, oh, well, if God was just more merciful, then they would have repented, but... No, even when he pours out his full wrath on them, they still uh, harden their hearts against them. And that leads to this fifth bowl, which is darkness. And it talks about how they just, instead of repenting, they're just in agony and they just bite their tongue. They gnaw on their tongues. Uh, it's kind of like in hell where it talks about how there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Uh, the gnashing of teeth is not just pain. It's a gnashing of defiance and rebellion and hatred against God. God gives Rome a taste of what hell is like in these bold judgments, and they still don't repent. And so God is righteous for judging them because they are just that wicked. And Jesus and his people win. We'll pick up there on Sunday with the Battle of Armageddon. <laughs> I'm so sorry we didn't get to it tonight, uh, but we will, Lord willing on Sunday. Thanks so much.